Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to the Committee on Public Safety, Military and, Gov and Governmental Affairs. Uh, it's Wednesday, March 8th at 3 o'clock in room 225. And this is one of the more pleasurable experiences uh, the Senate gets to undertake is confirming really good people to needed positions within the state government. Um, and we have two uh, nominees for very important departments. And I'm sorry, I have to do a couple of housekeeping um, announcements that uh, this hearing is being taped live, or not taped, but being streamed live on YouTube in the unlikely event that we have some type of technical difficulties. We will reschedule this hearing and of course make public notice of that hearing. Cross our fingers, that's never happened in two years. So I'm sure today will be uh, going quite smoothly. Um, and uh, that's the announcement. So we're gonna just jump in. Oh, just before we start, um, what I'd like to do on confirmation hearings is I'm going to read the uh, folks who have submitted written testimony, call out the people who would like to testify in person, um, then call up the nominees for uh, to, to share with us how they want to redirect the two departments and then open it up for questions from the members. So we're going to proceed in that uh, manner. In support, uh, Governor Josh Green, uh, Don Chang from DLNR has submitted testimony in support. Jade Butai, Director of Transportation, has indicated he might be here, but is not, and has submitted testimony in support. Tommy Johnson from Public Safety. I said we're going to test from the okay, thank you. Oh, pardon, Ms. Chang, um, do you want to no, say something on behalf? Of I just, uh, thank you very much, Senator. I stand on my written testimony. Thank you for letting me testify. Oh, thank you for being here. Uh, Department of Health um, has. Hi. Good morning, uh, Chair, uh, Good afternoon, and committee members. My name is Kenny Pink with the Department of Health. Uh, I'm here to testify in strong support. Uh, from a Department of Health perspective, we've actually worked very closely uh, with Major General Hara um, and Brigadier General Logan on the air ambulance situation. Uh, and as needed, uh, he's just demonstrated, um, you know, the initiative when we had to rely on uh, having a Black Hawk activated to ensure we had a backup plan for air ambulance uh, to provide necessary critical services. Uh, he uh, exhibited uh, just a great balance of commitment to mission and also um, advocating for the welfare of his troops. Um, so just can be very impressed. On a, on a personal note, I recently retired from the Hawaii Air National Guard. Um, so was actually under um, Major General Hara's command. Uh, and as I've moved into this new role, he's just uh, really treated me well uh, with respect and appropriately. Uh, I still sh struggle with the uh, uh, being on not on par with the two star. But again, he has uh, exhibited tremendous character and support for me. And I just want to share um, my personal experience. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Doug Burdock from ETS has been testimony and support. Louis Salaveria from the Bud Department of Budget and Finance has also submitted testimony and support. Fred Hoon from the Proling Authority has submitted testimony and support. Stephen Logan, Hawaii Air National Guard, has submitted testimony in support. Sabrina Nasser from the Department of Budget and Finance, also in support. Frank Pace from uh, Office of Homeland Security, also in support. Kathy Betts from Department of Human Services, in support. Len Higashi from HTDC in support. Keith Hayashi from the Department of Education, also in support. Ed Sniffen from the Department of Transportation. Mr. Sniffen has indicated he would be in person, but uh, has submitted testimony in support. Scott Glenn from the Office of Planning and Sustainable Development has submitted testimony in support. Sharon Hurd from the Department of Agriculture, all in also in support. Kevin Beggs from the Hawaii State Fusion Center is in support. Gary Suganuma, excuse me, from the Department of Taxation, also in support. Herman Andaya from the Maui Emergency Management Agency is in support. Scott Su from the Hawaii Electric Industries in support. Mufi Hanneman from the Hawaii Tourism and Lodging Association is in support. Jason Chung from the Military Affairs Council is in support. We have a number of individuals. Colton Ching, Jordan Loeb, Victor Ramos, Lon Peressa, Pankish Banok, uh, Gary Yoshi Roya, Carlton Ching, Michael Vincent has indicated he would be here. Oh, Mr. Vincent. 
Chair Rakai, Vice Chair Elefante, and Senator Fukunaga. Uh, thank you for the opportunity of uh, coming and joining me this afternoon and taking your time to uh, review General Hara and, and his the things he's done and his capabilities. So, um, in my career, you know, it's it's people enter public service for various reasons, and for most of us, you know, we enter public service with the idea of of doing good and and trying to do our best for the people that, that we serve, wh whatever that sphere of influence might be. And General Hara is one of those rare individuals that has entered a career, you know, he went uh, from OCS and, and forward. He's, his career is a single focus, and that's protecting and taking care of the people of the state of Hawaii, the people that, that he's charged with watching over and protecting. And I've had the opportunity of working very closely with him on uh, some very difficult issues and challenges facing the public and their health and safety. And one of the things that, that has always impressed me is as we're working on things, it's always the big picture. What we can't please everybody, and you understand that we can't make everybody happy, but every decision that he makes, everything that he's done has been for the greater good. What's the best thing to help protect the majority that are under the stewardship? Even in his command, uh, I have never heard anybody speak ill of General Hara. And I've worked very closely with the National Guard for over three decades and, and I've heard venting and never have I ever heard anybody speak ill of General Hara. And, that in itself is a testament to his command and his relationship with those in his in his organization. And I just, uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity to be able to serve with him and continue serving with him in my new role. But thank you for the opportunity to take a few moments of, of your valuable time and being able to share some of my thoughts about General Hara. Thank you. Thank you for sharing those insights with us, Mr. Vincent. Neil Mitsuyoshi in support, Ron Han, Kurt Utoguro, all of these individuals are in support. Audrey Hidano, Scott Murakami, Billy Oku, Chris Sadayasu, Robert Lee, Phyllis Shimabukuro, Daryl Wong, Keith Reagan. Chair Wakai, Vice Chair Elefante, Senator Fukunaga, it's nice to see you this afternoon. I stand on my written testimony that I submitted in support of General Hara. I just wanted to offer a few brief insights. Um, having served as the managing director for the county of Maui for, for many years um, and having gone through many different incidents, whether they be tsunamis, earthquakes, uh, mudslides, <laughs> you name it. Um, one thing that we could always count on was General Hara being there for us and supporting the county. Um, as a neighbor islander, oftentimes we worry about you know being disconnected and not being supported. But I can tell you that in every incident that we had, that we had to deal with on Maui, in Maui County, General Haro was there to back us up 100%. We didn't have to worry about whether or not we would get the support we needed to survive. And so I just wanted to share that insight. That was, a little bit of that was included in my written testimony, but I just want to express my deep appreciation to, to the general for all that he's done for Maui County, the people of Maui County. And I ask you know, for you to please confirm him today. Mahalo. Leo Asuncion, Riker Wada, Nadine Ando, Jimmy Tokioka, all individuals in support. Is there anyone else wishing to testify on uh, GM 509? Ken for that's the General the Department of Defense. If not, General Hara, if you'd like to uh, I mean, share with us a little bit about your vision for the Department uh, of Defense and maybe share a little bit about your background. Okay, so Chair Wakai, Vice Chair Elefante, Senator Fukunaga, I am Major General Kenneth Hara and the Adjutant General nominee for the State of Hawaii Department of Defense. Um, and I seek your support for um, recommending to the full Senate for my advice and consent. Uh, I joined the National Guard in 1984 following in the footsteps of my family. So almost 39 years of service. Um, I've also been the Deputy Adjutant General for uh, Governor Ige for five years and then three years as the Adjutant General. And I really would wish to, to continue on 
serving as the Adjutant General for the State of Hawaii, for all of our communities, and uh, for the Green Administration. Um, I, I, I really appreciate, kind of humbled by all the, the comments of my colleagues here, but I have served in some very challenging operations throughout my career, three deployments into Baghdad, Kuwait, and Afghanistan. Um, back in 2006, I was a task force commander for the earthquake that struck the island of Hawaii. And then I was the dual status commander. So I commanded both active duty and National Guard forces. Top priorities I wanted to talk about that, that I really want to focus on for the next few years. Uh, the first is improving the readiness and capability of the Hawaii Emergency Management Agency. Um, and then the next is still focusing on the Hawaii National Guard, making sure that they are always ready and always prepared, right? Focusing on their readiness, if necessary, to fight and win our nation's wars, but more importantly, using all of those skill sets and capabilities in service of the state for any natural or human caused disaster. And then lastly, um, we do want to build a world class emergency operations center up in the Mililani um, First Responders Tech Campus. Um, the Berkheimer Tunnel is inadequate to support a major disaster and I have, I have significant concern. So that's one of my priorities to get that emergency operations center constructed. So I, I worked with every single one of you previously and uh, I hope that I can work forward with you in the future and uh, I'm available for any questions. <clears throat> You know, General Haro, it was such a <clears throat> monumental experience going through COVID over the last several years. Would you say that uh, this has been probably a time when the National Guard has been deployed in more instances than you can remember during previous emergency conditions? Because those were sure. relatively short um, cycles you know i remember during the hurricanes Kauai, and all the uh, rainstorms and everything else 04 06 etc but i think COVID has been the most extended uh prolonged deployment yeah by far i was interviewed once and i said this has been the most challenging event for me and, and it's the same thing for the national guard nationwide as you alluded to most disasters you're on a week a few days maybe a month or two um, the earthquake response I mentioned from 2006, I was on for 30 days. And back then as a, as a young Lieutenant Colonel, I thought that was a long time. Um, fast forward to 2018, when I did the Kilauea volcanic eruption, I said that was the slowest moving disaster that I ever ex experienced. But that was almost two months for me. I, I really thought 2018 was gonna be that seminal year that it can't get worse than this. And then, you know, 2019, I become the Adjutant General in, in December. And, and then we roll right into a, a worldwide pandemic. And yes, by far, you know, I was the incident commander for, for two years. It has challenged the National Guard. Thankfully, we had a lot of federal resources that came in because with the state budget, there's no way we could have lasted that long, but absolutely. Well, thank you very much for all of your service. It thank was you. much appreciated. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, General Hara, for stepping up uh, to the call of duty. Uh, no pun intended there. But um, I just have several questions and a comment. Okay. Uh, first question specifically has to do, you talked about uh, readiness and being, knowing what your department and agency has gone through could you talk about you know your role in terms of morale for your department mm -hmm. and how do you manage uh, to keep morale up in that sense? So, so the first thing is our most precious resource are our people, right? And it starts with recruiting the brightest, right? And the most qualified and definitely people from the state of Hawaii that understand our culture. So getting the right people hired is the first step. And then the training and education to make sure they have all of the tools necessary to be able to do their job properly. And then the resources. And it's about taking care of that resource, taking care of our people, making sure they're promoted at the right sequences, making sure they're paid. Um, so, and then if there's issues, rapidly responding to those issues and trying to address it as soon as possible. And then in terms of recruitment, as you mentioned, uh, where, where are we in terms of that and recruiting you know, people for our, 
Hawaii Air National Guard. Right. So we, we had about a hundred and I think 170 or so vacancies when I did my information briefing to the Ways and Means Committee uh, in January, late January. And in that short, you know, month and a half time, we were able to recruit um, 19, actually hired 19. I'll have eight more hired in a week. And then of all my vacancies that I'm funded for, all of them are in the process of being hired with the exception of just three positions. They were just priority. So um, through the help of my deputy, Steve Logan, I asked, I had tasked him to take this on as the number one priority because we need the resources, the people. Um, and he's done a phenomenal job. And finally, I, I, I think um, I would also like to <clears throat> share a personal experience. And I think uh, Senator Fukunaga would definitely agree with me, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic in terms of readiness and your leadership in leading the efforts on, you know, what supplies do we have? Do we have enough oxygen in our hospitals? You know, where are we in terms of COVID? Uh, and I think those calls were truly helpful to really include all agencies. So thanks to you and your team um, and being a participant in that along with my staff, I felt that you guys really took it above and beyond uh, to be prepared in a situation we've never been in before. Thank you, appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sure. Members, any further questions? Senator Law. It's just to get this one on record, I know okay. we already talked about it, but since you're uh, talking about hiring, mm -hmm. as you know, I could have been working for you guys in Hyema, but you guys hired somebody from out of state less qualified. Heard you talk about you know how you're hiring and whatnot, but can you commit to hiring locals? So on the record, yes, absolutely. That's going to be a priority. We'll, we'll hire local first. There's so much talent and experience here in Hawaii. And I had mentioned that we, we have a different culture and it, it's hard sometimes for someone that has never lived in Hawaii to, to understand how we do things. Um, th there are a lot of people that have moved over that realize, and, and probably moved over because they experienced the culture previously, and, and they, they come in and, and fit in just as well, right, if they're mm -hmm. residents here. But I'm totally committed to hiring local. I just want to make sure, because, you know, how as you bring people in, locals got to leave. So Right. I got it. Thank you. Sure. I want to try to understand the horror and magic that you have to make tough decisions and make it not right sometimes we see like the <clears throat> modernization plan or whatever it takes years right you have bureaucrats that are behind you that watch over things for a long duration of time and hopefully achieve <clears throat> some goodness during their time you have to make decisions on the spot and take into the totality of the immensity of everything from covid to national events to other um, threats that may befall us but everybody in this room thanks you and every piece of testimony is positive towards you. And everyone recognizes the difficulty of your job, but they still really like you. <laughs> Which is amazing because we make the decisions that we hope is good for the community, but there's undoubtedly people who will, if we were sitting there, come back and say, you know, Brandon did this, Carol did this, I did this, Brandon did whatever, right? But for you, like, it's the complete opposite. You make tough decisions and people respect that and they still like you. That's the magic. <laughs> Um, I, I think a comment one is you do need to be good at what you do and understand your profession and two is being lucky and a lot of times is it's, it's about timing um, I I've been lucky and I've been good at what I do because I surround myself with highly qualified people as I mentioned you know my deputy adjutant general uh, Steve Logan and then all of the, the division heads within the department they, they help me look good. So first I need to understand, so if the governor or even the, the state legislature is giving me guidance, I need to be able to absorb that and understand to be able to get after what the true intent is. The, the other reason we've been successful, we're highly successful during the, the Kilo volcanic eruption and in, in COVID-19 is I gave out two, two key guidances during my first press conference. And the, the first one is, we need to move at the pace of unprecedented crisis. It cannot be the normal bureaucracy. We've got to figure out ways to get things done now. So that was the first thing I told them. The second one I told them is our center of gravity is responsiveness. We cannot be flat-footed. We cannot be waiting until we need something to figure out what we're going to do. So to be responsive, we need to anticipate needs 
And then once we figure out what those needs are, to adequately organize ourselves and resource ourselves to meet those needs. So when the call comes, we're ready to go. Uh, case in point was during the COVID-19 response, um, we went early on to the Department of Health to, to ask them to train my medical, because I got medical professionals in the Army Guard and the Air National Guard. I got doctors, I got epidemiologists, right? I got dentists, um, optometrists, everything you can think of. We have all of this medical experience. Let's get them trained in what your gaps are, the contact traces, disease investigation, um, and had some problems. So we said, okay, we know the ass is gonna come. We're not getting any help, but let's get our people trained anyway and put them on the shelf. So if the ass um, does come our way, we're ready to respond. So when they called and said, hey, we need help. Uh, we need contact tracers. How long is it gonna take to train them and when can you get them? You're talking two months, three months? I said, I'll have two people there today to help with the coordination and the rest like 20 something, they'll be there tomorrow. And you're like, what? I said, they all trained, they're ready to go. We're just waiting for the call. And so that's why, you know, to make tough decisions, don't just sit back and, and wait till you need to make the decision, just anticipate it. Think of it ahead of time. Yeah, I love your initiative. Um, you talked about the necessity for that new first responders tech park in Mililani because, uh, is it Brokheimer? Brokheimer. Brokheimer mm -hmm. in Diamond Head, just not adequate. But the reality is that the first responders tech park is years down the road, right? It's just raw land. There is like not even a road, paved road there. There's no infrastructure. So in, in consideration of the fact that it'll be years before you, you even begin to start migrating out there, um, are there any needs in Berkheimer that you need uh, to shore it up and hold you over till uh, the first responders tech park in Milani becomes a reality? Um, I, I would say no for right now because um, Luke Myers, the previous administrator, had a pretty good vision on trying to make um, Berkheimer more robust. In, in fact, they're not even operating out of there now because of some of the work that's being done. And we, we built some significant capability in another building um, on that in, within the Diamond Head Crater, that's a continuity of operation site. So once we get the rest of the employees back into Berkheimer, I think that's enough to hold us over for now other than some you know, minor maintenance issues that may be foreseen, may not be foreseen. Welcome, uh, Senator McKelvey. We're in the Q&A part, of things. Do you have any questions for no, General? No, I'm, uh, I've been very privileged to work with the General over the years. I appreciate everything you've been doing, especially during COVID-19, the disaster response and coordination. And, uh, you know, I guess probably what I was going to ask has been touched upon by the members already, but what's your role real quickly do you see in so far as coordinating with the federal government, particularly to theater-wide threats? You know, some of the... <clears throat> Predictions that have come out of Joint Chiefs of Staff, staff particularly to China, you know, obviously raises concerns. What, how do you see your role in being able to coordinate should a threat of that level emerge? All right. So my so my role is first. I, I'm very embedded within the um, the U.S. Indo Pacific Command. Um, Admiral Aquilino allows me to to attend his um, update briefings, so I understand the threat. I understand what Indo PACOM is doing. Um, what we call Title Ten, right? The active duty operations or campaigning. Um, my role as the Adjutant General is to ensure that my Air National Guard and Army National Guard are properly administered, recruited to, funded, um, train, training and operations to be able to meet their wartime missions. We are laser focused and, and I tell them, if we're not building readiness, we're not doing it anymore. If it's not focused on the Indo-Pacific region, we're not gonna be doing it anymore. We need to be prepared to fight and win our nation's wars if called upon. So that, that's my role in ensuring we get the, the training resources to be able to meet all of those demands. Members, any further questions? If not, thank you, General Carr. Thank you, Chair. For your willingness to serve. We're gonna move on to GM 510. This is for Consideration the confirmation as the director of Department of Law Enforcement, gubernatorial nominee Jordan Lowe. On our testifiers list, we have uh, Governor Green who submitted testimony support, as well as Doug Murdoch from ETS in support, Luis Salaveria from Department of Budget and Finance in support, 
Don Ching from Deal and Art is in support. Thank you very much. Very much, Sanchi. Hi, I'm members of the committee. Um, DLNR stands in strong support. I would just like to reiterate that um, Doe Care works closely with the law enforcement, and I've appreciated the coordination with Mr. Lee. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming down to find Mr. Chang. Keith Hayashi from the Department of Education has submitted testimony in support. Jennifer Igami from DLE Human Resource Officer. Has indicated she might be here in person. Uh, no Igami. So, Sabrina Nasser from Budget and Finance in support. Heidi Lee from the Department of Public Safety has submitted testimony in support. Tommy Johnson. Uh, uh, Tommy Johnson from Public Safety. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Jordan, what was your brother? We're going to have to hear about that in a few minutes. Um, Michael Vincent. Good afternoon again. You've got my written testimony. Now, earlier I talked about public servants and the idea of doing the best that we can for our communities. and. Um, I've served for a number of years in another department and for whatever reason they've asked me to um, serve with Jordan in the new department of law enforcement and leaving the other department was the hardest thing I ever did because I love that job. I love working with the people that I work with. Um, but I looked at the opportunity that the legislature has presented by the creation of the department of law enforcement and I've had the opportunity to work with a lot of leaders. And one of the things that really sets this apart is Jordan is able to bring together a team of, of people. And I don't know why he's got me. I mean, I'm dumber than a box of rocks, but everybody else that he has is exceptional. Everybody is focused on probably one of the most important and difficult tasks is putting together a new state department. We have no home. We're trying to get a home and, and working through the bureaucracy of, of getting a, a building for us. Uh, we don't have, there's just six of us right now. Uh, come July 1, there's uh, additional positions that we hope will, most of which will be filled. And then January 1, the uh, rest of the law enforcement uh, elements from the Department of Public Safety, some from the Department of the Attorney General, and the Department of Transportation Harbors Division will be coming over. And Putting all of these law enforcement assets under one roof is a monumental task. Then you've got the bigger task of, you've now got a state law enforcement agency. That agency needs to work with the county police departments, the other state agencies, the federal partners, the county prosecutors. There's a lot of partners that need to be engaged in protecting our communities. And one of the things that I've admired with Jordan, and once again, I haven't, I don't have decades of time with him, but in my short time, what I've seen is the ability to bring together all of these entities, the leaders at these different levels, with the desire of all doing the same thing, working together for the protection of our communities. And that is an amazing, amazing trait. I'm grateful for the opportunity to work with him and the rest of the team that he's put together because he's put together a great team. Everybody has their own strengths. We all have our weaknesses, but together the synergy that's created is a good thing. We see good, good things coming. We see nothing but as I look at the people we're working with within our department and within our partners, is the positive vision that everybody has for the future of the people in Hawaii. And I'm just grateful for the opportunity to be able to be here today and spend some time with you this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Vincent. Fred Hoon from the Paroling Authority in support. Daryl Ng, 
from the Sheriff's Special Operations Section in support. Ed Sniffin from the Department of Transportation is in support. Uh, Frank Pace, Hawaii Office of Homeland Security is in support. David Rodriguez from Labor and Industrial Relations has indicated he might be here, but it is not. Uh, General Hara is in support. Thank you, Chair, Vice Chair, Committee members. Again, Major General Ken Hara. Um, I had the distinct pleasure and opportunity to work with Jordan in the past few years. Um, and I know that he's the best person to be the director of the Department of Law Enforcement. Um, he was, we worked very closely with them as they're starting the, the framework to develop and, and design the department. And I, I think with that continuity, um, he's the perfect choice and um, his leadership skills. And if you look at his his background, all of the law enforcement experience at, you know, at the state, county, and uh, local le and um, federal levels, this is impressive. Thank you. Thank you, General. Gary Suganuma from DOTAX is in support. Kathy Betts from DHS is in support. Kevin Baggs from Hawaii State Fusion Center is in support. Kenneth Fink from the Department of Health. Thank you, Mr. Fink. Tom Brady from CC Honolulu, City and County of Honolulu. Tom Brady. Thoughts <laughs> Good afternoon, Senators. Thanks for allowing me to speak on behalf of Jordan. Uh, I've known Jordan uh, for over 20 years. Uh, we first met when I was at the U.S. Attorney's Office, and Jordan was uh, a special agent with the Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosive uh, Federal Agency. And uh, throughout those 20, 25 years, we worked many, many, many cases together and talk about some of the prior testimony about teamwork, professionalism, leadership. Uh, Jordan is the best. He really is. Uh, we worked on the uh, poly golf course shooting case together. And basically, Jordan put that together with the FBI and, and other agencies, local agencies. Uh, it takes a lot of work. Uh, and he was there every step of the way. Uh, I can't think of a better candidate for this position. And I think he will serve you well. Thank you. Sharon Hurt from the Department of Agriculture has submitted testimony in support. Scott Glenn from the Office of Planning and Sustainable Development. Scott. Uh, Stephen Austin, prosecuting attorney. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair Wakai, uh, members of the committee. Yeah, I've worked with Jordan for more than 25 years. He was a great supervisor there. and the ability of the supervisors in the federal system to get along with each other and with HPD is critically important. He has no ego. It's all about collaboration. Well, he was a great uh, investigator. His wife was a great, Lynn was a great investigator too. Uh, so they run, it runs together. Uh, but it, taking on this role, it's going to take tact and strength. You've got to pull these agencies that have their own identities together and then work with HPD. And it, but we're excited about doing it because there'll be joint training. There'll be better training overall of everybody working together, the reports, it'll all be consistent. So uh, I, think it's, I think it is a great choice and we're looking forward to working with Jordan if he becomes the next director. So thank you very much. R. Doug Otten from the Wahiawa Community Business Association has submitted testimony support. Gary Yabuta. Anderson He, Wesley Wong, all individuals in support. Um, I have a lot of testimony of individuals in support. Just for your ego, Jordan, I'm gonna read all your fans' names. Uh, Reagan Fong. <laughs> People took the effort to go in and write a letter of support, so I think they at least should be put on the record as being your fans. Robert Kavako from Shopo, Eric Lalau, Keith Kamita, Tiffany Nakashima, Thomas Cayetano, Wade Morooka, Maria Zelinsky, Patricia Aguilar, Melanie Martin, Kathy Moriyama, Dean Sukara, Erin Misa Kamiyama, I'm Japanese, I can't pronounce the Japanese name, Kamiyama, Erin uh, Yuen, Ernie Martin, Max Otani, Gary Yamashiroya, Koa Dabrowski, Valerie Lin Linuma, excuse me, 
Derek Nakamura, Michael Church, Jason Pa, Ralph Lambright, James Ewan, Ron Roy Nakama, Frank Okamura, William Kilioku. Sure. Oh, Hello. hi, Billy. You want to join us? Sure. Thank you, Billy. Craig Williams, Charles Walton, Franklin Don Picaro, Taro Nakamura, Ray Yuen, Chris Sarayasu, Michael Ogawa, Edward Nishi. If by chance I call your name and you want to speak up, feel free to interrupt me. Uh, Maria Cook, Laura Mayashiro, Peter Nakagawa, Keith Reagan, Stephen Lee. Uh, has indicated that Stephen might be here. Uh, Mark Hanohano, Brandon Atsuka, Michael Hoffman, Brooks Bear, Reef Makue, Carrie Doy, Adrian Kanoa, Robin Nagamine, Nalani Myers, Larry Tong, Nadine Ando, Jared Rudella, uh, Robert Ayu. My name is Robert Ayu. I'm a retired DEA Drug Enforcement Administration Special Agent, and I've known Jordan for 30 years, and uh, Micah's dad. And uh, <laughs> during the period of time, I, I've seen Jordan develop to where he's at right now. And um, I also want to say that you have a very important role here, which I'm sure you're very aware of. And the significance for me is that in 2014 and 2015, I worked here as the chief of staff for the Senate president. So I know what you folks do and the time and effort that you have to do to vet, to get the best candidates that you can for the state of Hawaii. Okay, very, very briefly, Jordan, has seven attributes that I believe, and everybody should agree with me that to be successful in business, private industry, government, you need these seven attributes. I memorize them, but just in case. Integrity, Jordan has them all. Intelligence, if he were not in law enforcement, he'd be a um, university professor teaching something like calculus. And he has to be diplomatic work with all the agencies, as some of the other speakers have said. His position is like the chief of police uh, for Honolulu. I mean, it's that, that important. Um, he has to be accountable to you folks, state of Hawaii, to himself. Um, and then you have to get performance out of your people, and you have to perform. But as Senator Elefante brought it up, which I thought was a great point, there has to be morale. What, what's the morale? And you mentioned this in respect to General Hara, but he has to do the performance aspect, but not have people fail on him. They, they have to produce. And so that's, that's very uh, difficult to do. And um, finally, especially in law enforcement, you have to be decisive. If you're not decisive, somebody can get hurt. Somebody can get killed. Okay, what I'd like to also say is I've known General Hara for many years too. And that goes back to when I was the uh, coordinator for the Drug Enforcement Administration Marijuana Eradication Program. And we worked with the police and the National Guard very closely. General Hara was one of our stellar pilots along with his deputy, uh, Stephen Logan. He was, he was another pilot. and. Uh, we worked very well, and throughout the years, I've seen him develop to where he is today. He's a general. Now, my last comment is when this COVID thing happened, I told my friends, I told my wife, I said, you know, there's only two type of people that can run this show. It's so important. A law enforcement person or a general. And sure enough, we got the general, and he got a spectacular job. So... I have the unique experience of speaking on behalf of both of them, and I hope they get confirmed, and I don't see any reason why they shouldn't. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ayu. Is there anyone else wishing to share their comments on um, GM1, oh, excuse me, 510? Yes. Tony okay, Ayu. Oh. 
Senate Chairperson, Honorable Members, good afternoon. I'm Tommy Ayub, retired from the U.S. Department of Justice, Drug Enforcement Administration, former Director of uh, Corporate Security for Hawaiian Airlines, um, Executive Director for the Hawaii Law Enforcement Memorial Foundation, and Hawaii News Now Law Enforcement Expert. I respectfully offer the following testimony on behalf of Jordan Lowe. You will hear many today who have known Jordan for many years. I offer a unique perspective as a former agent in charge of the DEA Honolulu ICE Task Force. This is where I first met Jordan 30 years ago. Honolulu was experiencing its first methamphetamine outbreak brought on by ethnic organized crime groups trafficking in Shabu and Batu. The DEA Honolulu ICE Task Force was formed with HPD, U.S. Customs, Immigration, NCIS, and together we targeted these organizations. However, not until Jordan Lowe from ATF joined did, joined did the Honolulu ICE Task Force make significant headway. Jordan brought with him federal gun and weapon charges that, that coupled with the drug trafficking violations provided that extra sentencing enhancement, uh, adding an additional 5, 10, sometimes even 20 years for each conviction. Because of Jordan, the ICE Task Force detected, disrupted, dismantled these organizations. We crushed them. Jordan was a big part of that. Jordan helped make Honolulu and the state of Hawaii safe. During those early years, I could see that Jordan was a consummate professional where integrity set the bar for all of us. Most important, he exhibited that strong moral compass and positive optimism to ensure that law enforcement officers treated everyone with dignity and respect. Jordan exemplifies the motto of protect and serve. He will be the architect of the new Department of Law Enforcement. He will shape it to be the 21st century policing model. He'll provide the community with all the support it needs and he'll do it with integrity and um, dignity. I speak for all law enforcement at the federal, state and local levels who fully support Jordan's confirmation as director. Thank you. Is there anyone else wishing to testify? If not, uh, Shalom, we could have you come up and share with us a little bit of your background and how you would like to uh, direct the Department of Law Enforcement in the future. Thank you. And again, my, my name is Jordan Lowe. I am both humbled and honored to be sitting before you uh, for consideration as a director for the Department of Law Enforcement. I would like to first inter, uh, introduce my wife of 34 years, uh, Lynn Lowe. Lynn. She an investigator. So she's, she's an investigator as well. She was a federal agent, yes. Yeah, so she, um, it's in here. Okay, it's okay, good. <laughs> you're, 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 ruining, you're ruining my rhythm here. <laughs> so, and I would like to take this opportunity to thank her for standing by me uh, during my 40 plus years of public service. Lynn, who is a McKinley grad and a UH grad, retired with over 24 years of federal service as the senior special agent in charge of the criminal investigators a service uh, division in Honolulu, which is part of the Department of Defense. And when it comes to firearms qualifications, she humbles me because she's a better shot. So <laughs> that's a true story. We have two great kids. My daughter, Jamie, uh, she wanted to help people, so she went into health services. She obtained her doctorate in physical therapy and is in a residency program in California as a DPT. My son, Ryan, is present here. Kind of looks like me, I, I was told. <laughs> He's a software engineer who has been published twice in professional journals and presented one of his papers in Europe on artificial intelligence as it relates to linguistics. While I have no idea what that means, it made for a great father-son European adventure. He chose not to be part of Hawaii's uh, brain drain and moved to the mainland. He chose to stay here, to work here, and to take care of uh, his grandmother. A career in law enforcement can take a physical and mental toll 
on those who undertake that challenge. I would like to take, tell you a story about a conversation I had with my son when he was around 11 years old. Like any father, I asked him what he wanted to be uh, when he grew up and whether he wanted to follow my footsteps as a special agent or as a police officer. His response shocked and broke my heart. He said, no, I would never want to put my own family through what you put mom and me through. He added, I didn't know when you would be coming home, whenever you left for a trip, and whenever, or if you would be lying dead on some street. I tell this story, story to illustrate the hidden sacrifices of law, all law enforcement officers and what their families have to undertake. So to my wife and children, I again thank you for standing by me during those many years of sacrifice that you had to endure. To the sheriff deputies, the Harbor police officers, PSD investigators, NED investigators, AG investigators, and all others that are joining the Department of Law Enforcement. I wanna thank you for your service and sacrifices. Rest assured that this department's administration understands and looks at you more than just a position number, a vacancy or a line item on a budget. The development of the new Department of Law Enforcement is a daunting task. Today I have my transition team present along with my deputy directors, the sheriff, first deputy, to, just to name a few of those who are committed toward the mission. It is due to their commitment and hard work the department is on schedule for all of the law enforcement assets to merge over on January 1st, 2024. I would further like to acknowledge Director Tommy Johnson and the PSD Ohana for their continued support during this transition period. <clears throat> Director Johnson was a trusted partner during my tenure at PSD. The overall mission of the Department of Law Enforcement is to establish trust, transparency, and legitimacy with the public, the legislature, and its partner law enforcement agencies as a full service law enforcement department. The Department of Law Enforcement will work parallel with state, local, and federal law enforcement agencies to ensure life safety is not compromised and to work with all the statewide emergency management agencies as well. In the first year, we would like to accomplish the establishment of the administrative structure and the successful transfer of all the law enforcement assets from PSD, the Department of Transportation, the Department of Defense, and the Attorney General's Office. And we are near that accomplishment now. We would also like to be able to enter into a lease and build out the new department's headquarters. And with the assistance of DAGS, we are also near that, that completion. I, I need to thank uh, Comptroller Reagan, if he's still here. The other things we, we need to address is to lessen the pay parity between the sheriff's divisions and their county counterparts. And we need to create an intensive recruiting plan to fill the vacancies and to improve our recruitments. And we're making movement toward both of those goals. It's just a matter of obtaining the funding to do so. One of our big tasks for the next four years is the initiation of the technology innovation for the department to include the computer-aided dispatch system known as CAD, records management system known as RMS, case management system, and to implement a body-worn camera program, a vehicle camera program, to be able to establish communication interoperability and to integrate with the Hawaii Fusion Center 
and later uh, to create a cyber digital security lab in Hawaii. During the next four years, we also intend to expand our, law, our areas of responsibility to include additional law enforcement coverage at the DKI International Airport and all of the Outer Island airports to assist Hawaiian homeland, uh, homestead lands, agricultural lands, and to provide supplemental coverage for DOE facilities and all other state properties. We believe we can do that by leveraging technology and filling the current vacancies. With the addition of the AG investigators division, part of them coming over, we intend to dedicate additional resources to the federal task forces to fight the gun violence, narcotics trafficking, and the illegal importation of fireworks that's coming into the state. We will also implement deputy sheriffs as task force officers, so they have upward mobility and a career path within the department. We intend to establish the Department of Law Enforcement Training Program and facility. And once th that is moved over, we intend to have the training division clear certif certified. Actually, we're gonna have the whole department clear certified. Right now, we're moving to have the Sheriff's Division certified by CALEA. We intend to do the whole department. So all the investigative uh, functions and the training division. We also intend to increase the number of basic recruit class per year and to make sure we detail subject matter uh, subject matter experts to, to instruct in those uh, classes. The Department of Law Enforcement embraces the initiative to relocate with other first responders and law enforcement agencies at the first responder Tech Park in Milani. I've had experience training in multi-agency departments uh, in Glencoe, Georgia, and over at the International Law Enforcement Training Center in Thailand. And that concept works. I have extensive experience as a senior manager and have served as the resident agent in charge of the Honolulu Field Office. I was a chief special agent for the criminal investigation section for the Department of Taxation, the chief investigator for the investigative services division for the Honolulu Prosecutor's Office and was the Deputy Director for Law Enforcement for the Department of Public Safety. I, I am now here the Interim Director for the Department of Law Enforcement. In conclusion, I believe I have the experience and necessary skill set to accomplish the above goals and to lead, and to lead the Department of Law Enforcement. With support from my family, friends, colleagues, and the transition teams, I think we will be able to set the foundation for the Department of Law Enforcement to better serve the public and the communities. Mahalo again for this opportunity and mahalo to everybody here who supported me with uh, written and live testimony. And I'm available for questions. Thank you, Mr. Lowe. Members, questions? Thank you. Um, thank you, Director Lowe. Um, definitely glowing remarks from a lot of your fans, as uh, Chair Kai did mention. Uh, and thank you for meeting with me early on, too. I think you're one of the first nominees to, that I've met with, along with your team, to explain your role in this transition. So I appreciate that. Could you describe where this new headquarters will be that you referred to in your testimony? Yes, uh, we, we are close to signing uh, with a building or a landlords are building on uh, King Street, King okay. and Cook. Okay, yeah. uh, so King and Cook, okay, so in town. Yes. Um, and then you talked about, I think you also, when we met, we talked about the security at our Department of Transportation airports. So is your vision to have law enforcement staffed at our local airports across our state? Yes. So right right now over at uh, DKI International Airport, there's approximately 80 deputy sheriffs there performing law enforcement functions, but they're also supplemented uh, with private security that that are sworn in as law enforcement officers. 
and on the neighbor islands, there are, o there are only uh, private security that are sworn in as law enforcement officers. So is there. the intention to kind of do away with the private security and have it all be law enforcement officers? Yes. Okay. And then finally, um, thank you for acknowledging um, the, the narcotics inspection as well as fireworks and with the leadership of Cheryl Kai and this committee and my colleagues, you know, we were able to pass a inspection container bill that's moved on to the house. So how do you see your, your role um, as the leader of this agency for an, an inspection program to investigate um, illegal fireworks coming onto our shores? So an inspection program is just one of the prongs that's needed to have a comprehensive interdiction program. Um, I, I think what we would do initially is uh, speak with all of the shippers and gain their cooperation in terms of uh, getting shipping documents before uh, before the container arrives. So you, you want to be able to operate on uh, actionable intelligence as opposed to just trying to find a needle in the haystack. So we would take that approach first and look at those shipments first because one, one of the methods um, that individuals that br bring in illegal fireworks is they'll pack the legal fireworks in the front, the illegal fireworks in the middle, and then legal fireworks at the end. So unless you decontainerize every single part and then open every box, you won't, you wouldn't be able to tell. So there's information on the shipping documents that will help us kind of narrow down the search. And then um, obviously if we, uh, when, when we do a random inspection, um, we would have to work with the shipper so it doesn't slow down commerce. And, and, and that might require that the inspections be done off property. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sure. Members, any further questions? Oh, oh, thank you. Likewise, you were one of the first nominees that met with me when you came in. And I'm very happy to hear about your plan for rolling out GLE to the neighbor island airport. So I'm sure there's a lot of dog owners out there who are very happy about that as well. So um, also on the firework inspection, you know, is there a plan? Or are you open to trying to use you know, new technologies and other types of things like gunpowder sniffing dogs to help, I guess, effectuate and make it more efficient insofar as trying to inspect containers, and spot suspect containers? Is that something the department looks at as part of any kind of strategic plan insofar as going forward with that? We, we already have explosive detection uh, canines. So what, what they do, they're, they're trained to uh, detect a multiple uh, range of nitrates and chemicals that are commonly used to manufacture explosives. So we already have them. And, you know, if we were to, to increase the inspection, uh, the random inspections, and uh, we would probably have to get additional resources to do that. And along with the canine itself, you would need the canine handler because mm -hmm. that individual is key on how long the dog works, how well the dog works. And then, uh, you know, do, do you see yourself expanding? We've had in our earlier discussions, there's a need for DLE services, you know, in other state facilities, like for instance, the DLNR small boat harbors, we discussed the security challenges there and they often don't respond or can't respond and county police, you know, up to a certain point, try to help if they can. Is there a plan? And I really appreciate the fact that you kind of not, you're not taking the watermelon in one bite in so far as standing up DLE. You're looking at incrementally growing DLE and strategically, you know, enhancing it. But is there a vision of yours with the department as far as the strategic growth plan to perhaps have DLE support or services like you do with DOT with DLNR, DOBOR and other uh, state programs and facilities? Yes, that 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 is our intent to do that. Um, a, a, lot, a lot of it, uh, comes back to staffing, mm -hmm. which is why we're going to try to start a very robust recruitment effort and, and try to either lessen the, the uh, pay parity or um, disparity and to look at different things like uh, recruitment incentives. Um, there was a recent article, a uh, news story on KHON2, which talked about how the mainland departments are are poaching our officers by offering forty thousand dollars, thirty thousand dollars, you know, signing bonuses, relocation bonuses, 
Um, you know, they mentioned that even Maui uh, County Police Department are paying retention pay, which, you know, it's very difficult to compete, you know, because we all understand that, you know, besides the calling to go into law enforcement, you still need to feed your family, you know, so it's, it's, it's very difficult to compete with some of these agencies. But in answer to your question, we, we definitely plan uh, to expand our areas of responsibility. And, and the way I, I really look at it, you know, the neighbor islands have less, uh, less law enforcement presence mm -hmm. than Honolulu. So as a state, that's where we should be. One of our intentions down the line is also to put investigators uh, on the neighbor islands so that they can respond faster to you know, crimes on state property and, and in the correctional facilities. That would be very welcome. Thank you so much, Director. Appreciate it. Thank you, Chair. I, I just think that uh, you and Jennifer Har are two like the most capable leaders that we have as nominees for any uh, of the departments. And sometimes we get nominees, and it's a leap of faith, right? You got to take a chance on this guy or, or gal. But I just see with you and Jennifer Har, it's not like that. I mean, if you, you're proven leaders, and we're really take your, your two departments into, into just into really good, good, good areas. And, but, with, but with the Department of Law Enforcement, I mean, you're like the George Washington of this department. <laughs> you're, you're the first, first guy in. Right? <laughs> 50 years from now, it'll be better or me, but you'll always be remembered as the first guy in to lead this department. I just think that, that it, it's so, I feel so confident that uh, you are the right person to, to, to lead this department. And I want to follow up on what you mentioned to uh, Senator Elefanti about your headquarters being in downtown Honolulu. Is there talk of you going and joining uh, Chairman Hara and DOD at the First Responders Tech Park, or would you plan to really grow out your presence here in downtown? No, our intent is to go to the Milani Tech Park. It's a good concept. I believe it's a good concept because normally when, when you're together, even if you're in a different agency, and you, you start running into people, you start working with them. That's how you you bond. And that's how you create credibility, you know, if, if everybody is doing the right thing. So yeah, it's our it, information too. Sure. Right? And, and, and all the technology that you want, uh, I don't think can supersede the fact that two law enforcement folks are just sitting across from each other or <coughs> passing the hallway and trading information. Correct. As, as well. Um, can I follow up to Senator McKelvey about uh, explosive sniffing dogs. I don't know enough about dog noses, but can, do these dogs, can they sniff out like fruits and other contraband other than explosives? So dogs are normally trained to detect one item or you can, you can cross train dogs to, for example, when, when I was with ATF, we had accelerant dogs. So they would sniff out uh, flammable accelerants at arson scenes, but they cannot sniff out explosives. And then the explosives dogs would only do the explosives. Um, and then, so, and then now you, now you have dogs that can, uh, sniff, for example, narcotics and be bite dogs. So you can use them, you know, in enforcement actions. Um, but it's, it's rare that it's going to cross that far over where the dogs sniffing for fruit is going to be able to sniff for narcotics. Mm -hmm. Well, the reason I ask is we, in the Wasting Means Committee, had a long discussion about you know the agriculture forms that people fill out coming in from on domestic flights. And over the seventy-three year history of the ag form, not one person in Hawaii has ever been prosecuted for bringing in contraband. So I just thought maybe uh, if you're going to have more presence at the airport, could could DLE pick up that responsibility of sniffing the bags? Because I think we, we as a community have a false sense of security that that little paper ag form where people are supposed to be honest. Uh, really is not a shield for us, whether it's contraband or viruses or, or, or things coming in. Do you think that DLE could expand into actually sniffing out bags that come in from uh, the U.S. mainland? I mean, it can do that, but it'd be a totally different program. You know, we, we even have a, a dog tank that can sniff electronic media. So in other words, they can find the thumb drives, the, uh, the little uh, memory cards, cell, cell phones that'll get smuggled into the prisons, you know. Um, so the electronic media dog helps with uh, you know, the AG's uh, ICAT 
investigative unit, the, the crime against the children, you know, for, for child harm. You know, so your concept is correct. We, you can get dogs to, to sniff fruit and have an enforcement effort on that. Um, but I, I think that would be a different conversation that we would have if you wanted us to actually develop a separate unit to do that. So. You know, the, in the past when I had uh, uh, dealings with the Sheriff's Department, I have to say in the past it was a very dysfunctional uh, division where people were just shishing on each other and there's a lot of kilikia amongst them, but I don't get the sense that that's the way it is now. How have you kind of changed the entire uh, environment there in the Sheriff's so where people seem to be happy to come to work? Um, really, it was a collaborative effort with uh, the then sheriff, now deputy director, William Oku, and uh, the chief deputy, uh, uh, Koa Dvorowski. Um, we got together and basically we, we wanted to change the culture. So two years ago, two and a half years ago, when we came on board, we started to do that. We wanted to, first of all, we wanted to provide them identity, which is why we have the uniform change. You know, we wanted to empower them to do their job um, because what we've learned is if, if people take pride in what they do, they do it better. So that that was a process, of somewhat of a slow process for us to, to do that. And, and that's what we've done. I, I think our, uh, even our grievance rates have lessened, you know, and, 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 that, and that's one thing um, I've told the union and I've told the media, we're not your enemy. We're here to work together, you know, for the benefit of the community and the public. So, um, and that's what we're going to continue to do. You know, we, we hope that as, as we expand our responsibility, provide them with better resources, um, provide them with, you know, some type of pay parity, you know, with the other departments, then they would not be looked at, you know, in that light that, that, that you just mentioned. So it's, that is one of the biggest things that we intend to do over these next four years. Members, any further questions? Mm -hmm. If not, thank you, Mr. Lowe. We're gonna take a brief recess prior to taking the vote. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your patience. Um, we are reconvening the Committee on Public Safety and Intergovernmental and Military Affairs on this Wednesday, March 8th, um, for advice and consent on two fantastic nominees. The first being GM509. This is for confirmation as Adjutant General for the Department of Defense, the gubernatorial nominee, Kenneth Hara. We saw the value of this uh, illustrious leader during COVID um, and in every possible task that he was given, he did it and did it in an exquisite uh, fashion, all to the betterment for the people of the, this state. So I'd like to uh, recommend that we advise and consent on GM 509 Kenneth Carr to be Adjutant General for the Department of Defense. Members, any discussion? Senator McKelvey? Uh, no, I want to support your recommendation, Chair. As I've said in the previous confirmation hearing, you know, there's a lot of talk of what you want to do and let's have discussions, and then there's actually walking the walk. And I've seen the general walk the walk, and I feel confident given the challenges that lay upon the horizon that he's truly the best person for the job. Any further discussion? If not, Senator Elefante, I vote yes. Okay, Chair's recommendation is to advise and consent on GM 509. Chair votes aye. Vice Chair votes aye. Senator Fukunaga. Aye. Senator McKelvey. Yes. Senator Awa. Aye. Mr. Chair, your recommendation is adopted. Thank you. On GM 510, this is for the confirmation, um, consideration for confirmation as the Director of the Department of Law Enforcement, gubernatorial nominee, Jordan Lowe. Again, we have a fantastic opportunity. Uh, Governor Green has given us a truly admired uh, leader who has shown himself 
Um, and what I like is that he just such a variety of different backgrounds on the prosecutorial side, on the investigative side, and on the federal level, on the state level, on, uh, on the county level. I can't imagine we have anybody in the state of Hawaii that has that just illustrious background. And the beauty of it is nobody has any problems with them, right? You would think that at one level, okay, there's a little bit of disagreement here, but uh, throughout all of the various backgrounds, all of the levels of government that he served, uh, and the tension and stress that is involved in the job that he had to do, that you would think that there'd be someone who would, and some people that would be uh, not happy, but everyone is so happy and so mm -hmm. good and had so much admiration for the, the direction that he's taken uh, himself in the past. And here he is as George Washington for the Department of Law Enforcement. <laughs> I can't think of anybody who could better uh, be the, the guy who puts the flag into the ground for this brand new department than Jordan Law. So it's gonna be the recommendation to advise and consent on this nominee. Members, any discussion? If not, so maybe I would to vote yes. Okay. Chair's recommendation is to advise and consent on GM 510. Uh, Chair votes aye, Vice Chair votes aye. Senator Fukunaga. Aye. Senator McKelvey. Yes. Senator Awa. Mr. Cherry, recommendation is adopted. Thank you. Congratulations. 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 Congratulations.